Sunday nights called Shepherding a Child's Heart. I think it should more accurately be rephrased as uh, Shepherding a Human Heart, because it really qualifies all hearts that need to be shepherded straight to the heart of God, uh, be it a child, parent, or anyone who is trying to live a godly life. And in one of the sessions, Reverend Ted Tripp makes the following observation, that man is a worshiper, <coughs> that man, I, is a worshiper, that we come from the womb with this uniquely human characteristic that we are made to be impressed. We are made to be dazzled. We are made to worship. Now if you think of God's creation, you think of all the creatures out there, you don't see a whole bunch of squirrels getting together and going, <laughs> <laughs> unless it's a really nice bird feeder. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? None of God's created creatures worship or even have the capacity to worship and the need and the drive to worship like mankind. And I listened to that and I thought, well, that's really an interesting thing. So the question, let me define worship. Let's define worship. It means to pay honor to. I have divine in here when it comes to God, but you know, worship in itself is to pay honor to. To reverence with what? Supreme respect and veneration. To honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. Submission says that you are placing yourself below another. And worship is when you acknowledge that, and then you submit yourself to whatever that is, that being, that something, right? That's worship. To honor and to revere. And it's really fascinating because the question becomes then, not whether or not we will worship. The question becomes, who or what will we worship? If you doubt the statement that man is made to be dazzled and to be impressed, consider how many professional sports teams there are. Okay? Today alone is what? Super Bowl. You probably, many of you, may know the names of the players, more players than you know the people in this church. Sad statement. Uh, you might know their stats. You might know, you know, well, who's the running back? You know, who, who's the wide receiver? Who did they used to play for? What's the coach's name? You might know all of that information. Actually know more about them than you do somebody you're seated next to. And you've been seated next to these people for years. And this, the thing is, is that we have this innate, how many, you know, how many people, I, can't, I don't even know the numbers, but I can't even imagine how many, how much money is made on jerseys, Posters, cups, you know, why? Why? Why do we want to wear the jersey of a player we never met? Somebody tell me. Well, what were you saying? You're like, I'm saying, man. What? Oh, what? Would you like to pay Jesus? To honor him. We like what they do. To honor him. Yeah, when you wear the shirt, you wouldn't wear, you know, you wouldn't wear a shirt with a Jets player in it. Ooh. <laughs> I'm sorry, you don't think you're left with a <laughs> You want to honor these people, which is ridiculous. They're just playing a ball game, you know what I mean? But see how we want, you know, we have this, in, how about, um, wait, think about how the you know, sports, sports idols. Uh, what's like the most watched television show on? American Idol. Ta da! I rest my case. American Idol. We want somebody to impress us. We want somebody that we can you know, give honor and somebody to dazzle us so that we can revere them and give them extravagant love. When the Beatles showed up, what did the women do? They swooned. I've never screamed like that in my life. 
if I do, there's a really good reason. <laughs> and it would not be because of another human being. You know what I'm saying? So, it, it just amazes me how true this statement is. Let, let's look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. This is so great. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been what? Amen. Clearly seen. Where have they been clearly seen? Everybody eyes to the back. Hey, what do you see out there? Huh? Oh my gosh, do you see the little duck in there? There's just a little bit of the water that's not frozen in there and they're just, you know, doing their thing. Don't you wonder, like, when you're snug in, in your bed, and when it was like minus four degrees last week, how, how the animals were, were staying alive? I mean, seriously, and I said, you know, God, you're such an awesome God that you give them the ability to survive something like that. They, you know, I don't know, man, they, they made it through. And I was thinking, you know what, none of us would have. But God, in his wisdom, gave us a brain so we could make blankets. And houses and have pillows. Isn't that amazing? But he didn't, he doesn't care for the little creatures any less. They all survived, and so did we last Tuesday night. You get it? And that's pretty amazing. Don't you know, look outside, it's like, mm, yeah, this gotta be a God. Okay. So it's clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. You know, uh, look at the sky, look at the clouds, look at the, the night sky, look at the and the other night, it was like, whoa, there's a, somebody set up a big old flashlight or something in the sky because you, you could go out and do like hand puppets out in the moonlight. It was really cool. Uh, and of course, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like the moon that gives light at night. How do, how do we not know that there is a creator God? And this is the point we're on. That man is without what? <laughs> you, yeah, okay. You just are. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him. It's, what are we talking about? We're talking about worship, right? We're talking about why, you know, reverence, giving honor, because we want to be dazzled. We want to be impressed. So they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was what? Amen. Trust me, we get dark. Our lives become dark when God is not magnified in our lives. The bigger God is, the smaller we become. Amen? Amen. And the smaller God becomes in our minds, the bigger who has to become? Amen. We do. So you see what I'm saying? It's like to glorify God, to honor Him, He must be big. That's why I was so stupid blessed with Ezekiel, uh, the records last week. Amen? Amen about just the throne room of God, what the appearance of the glory of God, not even God himself, just the appearance of the glory of God and how ridiculously awesome that is. So, you have that awe-inspiring, powerful depiction of God, of Yahweh, of his throne room in Ezekiel, and then it says here, you take that, these people who knew God, who knew that, Professing to be wise, they became fools, and here's what they did. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God that we heard about last week. They exchanged that for corruptible man. Look around you. I ain't seeing any rainbows coming out of your eyes. I don't see any barrel with little wheels and things. I don't see none of that. Nobody is bowing down to you and throwing crowns around your feet, are they? Not lately. <laughs> uh, you understand what I'm saying? There ain't no six-winged things going, holy, holy, holy is Charlie. <laughs> right? When that starts happening, you know, that's different. That ain't going to happen in this life. You get it? Where are all these creatures, you know, who, whose eyes with the ten heads and the twelve faces and the whatever? You know, I have four and six and so When you're know, going like this, Holy, holy, where, you know, worship him. Who, where is that going on? Around the throne room of who? Okay, now, to know this, 
Like, we're all without excuse, aren't we? Because we came to church. Those of you who didn't come to church last week, you're all good. <laughs> <laughs> Those of us who heard all that, we're in trouble. If we, we, we do an exchange program. This exchange program is to take that, that glory, right, and give it to somebody else. And say, well, it's now Jim's. We're going to give that to Jim. And a corruptible man. Or, wait, I've got a better idea. Here's a seagull. <laughs> let's, let's put him on a little wheel. Oh, or, or here's my favorite, crawling creatures. Wait, excuse me. Oh, yes, look, it's an earthworm. Oh, great earthworm. I exalt you. I reverence for earth. Wait, wait. Oh, sorry. Oh, right. <laughs> that word. Oh, okay. You, you see what I'm saying? It's like, I'm going to tell you a story about this awesome God, by the way. This morning, two things disappeared from our house. And both of them are very important. One was my driver's license, which there was not, it, it was not in my purse, in my wallet at all, which just kind of freaked me out a little bit. And uh, so, um, you know, we're over and around looking for my driver's license. And the other was Scout. Scout is a green anole about this big. And he, we didn't know him. So he was gone. He was not in his cage. And we're like, oh, who left him out? And he was running around. So he was gone. So we spent, you know, like morning looking for him. And to no avail. That's it. We figured, well, we'll find him when he starts smelling bad. And I'll reapply for the license. Blah, blah, blah. So I love putting my coat on. Richard was already outside. He comes right back in and goes, look, I found your license. And I got my coat on and I go, and my, you know, my eyes went to the corner of the kitchen and there was a box of Kleenexes with a Kleenex cover on it and I lifted them up and there are the scalp. <laughs> Something. Be it 
the true creator or the lie of serving creation? You understand that those are the two choices. So I often refer to this innate need as man's God-shaped what? A God-shaped hole that man is going to fill with something. Every single one of us has filled that God-shaped hole with something. It may be packing peanuts, you know, which have no value. It may be Chinese food that holds you for a while, but now you're still hungry. You know, it may, it may be personality. It may be, an, I'll tell you what it's going to be, uh, another human. What did it say? Right? You know, another man, a, a corruptible man, or a creature, another creature. Oh, I just love my children. You know, could be our children. That's what we've shoved into our God shaped hole. Could be our success. It could be our pride and our, our provision for ourselves and our families. It could be our, our sickness. You know, it could, it could be whatever our issues or whatever we love. It could be football. We, sh we sh take it, we shove it into this God-shaped hole because we are worshipers. God has made man to be a worshiper, to, to know that he's supposed to be dazzled and he's supposed to be impressed. And when he is dazzled and when he is impressed, he responds. We are all responding to something. The question is, have we done a poor exchange program of who we venerate, of what we reverence, of where we spend all of our energy and resources? Oh my gosh, it's amazing. So you see from this record that man wants to fill that void. Man wants religion. Man wants religion. He wants to serve something. And that can be all of those things. It, some of them isn't as obvious as a molten or a carved image, right? How many times, you know, do you guys have a whole lot of those at home? You know what I mean? It's, you're not going to go home and, and genuflect to a, you know, a shoe, right? You know, oh, the gourd, no, the sandal. It's probably old people. So, it's, it's never that obvious. But whatever it is for you and for me, when we find religion, when we find religion, we are bound by it and to it. So it had better be the right thing. Now, religion is an interesting word. Do you have religion up here, yeah? Religion is a word in Latin. It has its re and ligo. Ligo is to bind. Re is to bind again. All right? This word seems originally to have signified an oath or a vow to the gods or the obligation of such an oath or vow. We see from many of the histories of the world that man will, what man will do for his religion. Amen? Travesties have incredible atrocities have been done in the name of religion. Religion is really any system of faith. Any system of faith and worship, normally consisting of, in, of a belief in a higher, a superior being. Amen? Superior than who? The one worshiping. You get it? So I can worship an idol, American or not. American idol, we worship those people because we think they are superior. You understand? than we are. We can worship our boss because we think he is superior. In other words, all of our energy and our effort and our honor and our reverence can go to these things. If some, let's say um, Michael Jordan came to your house for dinner. Well, that's a stupid example, but would you clean the house? Would you fix something special? Would you pull out a basketball and say, show me some moves? Yeah. You know, absolutely. Why? The guy could be a complete idiot. He could be a godless, evil individual, and you don't know. But because he's Michael Jordan, and he is an idol, sports idol, we respond to him 
differently than we do if Mona was coming over. You understand? What's wrong with that picture? If the President of the United States, yes, I understand we should honor people, men in authority. The scriptures tell me that. But I'll tell you what, we should have that reverence to, and that love and that service to the person sitting next to you. Amen. They're the one that has Holy Spirit that we heard today in manifestations. You get it? That's the person that we should be, that, you know, who is greater than you? Who is superior to you? You should. You got Jesus Christ and you got God, and that's it. That's it. Everybody else you treat equally with the love of Christ. Amen. That's what it's all about. Now, the word religion says to bind. And this is the problem. That in religion, if you if if you are if you are venerating and honoring and, and, and worshiping any power other than the true God, you are in bondage to that power. You follow me? So you become in, we're, we become bound, we become captives to falsehoods, to lies. Because there is no one else who can truly satisfy you. There is nothing else that can provide for you and no one else who can be God in the true sense of the word. All else is shifting sand. All else is, is, is a hologram, man. It, it ain't real. You swear, but as soon as you touch it, you can pursue it, pursue it, pursue it. Then you realize it's nothing. It's nothing. Just fading smoke screens. And that, unfortunately, is what religion is for many people. The truth is the only thing that sets people free. And yet, if their religion is not Yahweh, then they are lied to. And those lies bind them to that rebinding, that religion. Let me show you a record of people who, like normal folks, wanted to worship someone. They wanted to worship something. And I want to show you how God reached out to them. Take the Bible and turn to Acts 14. We're going to be looking at just this one record in Acts 14 <clears throat> about a guy sitting at Lystra. Now, Lystra is a uh, city where this man lived, <clears throat> he had no strength in his feet. <clears throat> Laying from his mother's womb, who had never walked. You, you get the picture? The guy has sat there and sat there and sat there. He's, he didn't get sick and, and stop walking. He has never known what it is to walk. His lameness was from a congenital defect. He has never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, Paul says with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. Stand upright on your feet. And the dude does it. That's crazy. Obviously, there's a spiritual thing going on where by the Holy Spirit, he perceived by his discernment that this guy had the faith and he called him out. And he, he didn't just stand up. What did he do? He leaped up and began to walk. Wouldn't you? So funny because his muscles and his bones had never been able to do it. So when God heals something, he really does it. I mean, the, you know what I mean? There ain't no physical therapy involved in this. Okay, now you have to go three times a week to, you know, a little brief therapy. They're really good down the street, you know. God healed him. And the whole thing, the brain, the, the nervous, the, you know, nervous system, 
motor function. The guy is up, leaping, and he is walking. Now, this is in Lystra. Lystra is not, correct me if I'm wrong, Victor, Lystra is not a very, um, Lystra is a, it's a pagan city. Um, you know, it's not a, a real great spiritual mecca here. Well, it is, but not for God, the true God. Now, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, wouldn't you? And they spoke in the Lycoanian language. <laughs> what? Oh, I don't know what it is. The gods have become like you try that. The gods have become like men and have come down to us. Doesn't this make sense? Holy Toledo, you got a major miracle. They've all known this guy. They have seen him every single day. And I'm sure a man crippled from his mother's womb is not a pretty sight, you know, physically. It has to be obvious. There's no musculature. That, you know what I mean? There's atrophy. These legs have never walked. Boom! He's up, leaping, and he's walking. So these guys, the, the town folk, are notably impressed. Saying in their language, well, what's, wait, wait, wait. Why are they saying this? Because this could be the only explanation for such an incredible thing that happened. The gods, the gods have come to And they began calling Barnabas Zeus, and they started calling Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker, and the priest of Zeus. Now listen to this. Now you got a whole town up in arms going, the gods have come to us, the gods have come to us, Zeus, Hermes, you know, they're 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 get, they're like worshiping, okay? Now, this guy's pretty smart. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, he's like, ooh, hmm, if it's true, uh, I better do something. Because he's the priest. So if Zeus has really shown up, what does he better get his butt over there with? Sacrifice. A sacrifice. So he says, and he, and he brings out oxen, and he brings garlands to the gates, and he wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. Big barbecue for Zeus. That's right. And Hermes gets a snack too. You know, it's like, woo, the gods are here. I mean, he's the god, he's the priest. He better be there to worship this god of his, right? He's his god. He's the priest of Zeus. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they ripped their robes to get people's attention. That's a, you know, it's an uh, Orientalism of, of incredible distress. They were like, you've got to be kidding me. This is so disgusting. You understand why? Because yes. these, these two know who did this. And here they're, they're trying everything they can to stop this disgusting worship of something or someone other than who? Who was responsible for this miraculous event? They tore off their robes and they run, they rush into the middle of the crowd, they're crying out and say, Stop it! Stop it, man, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Quit this. This is insane. We are also men. See, look, look, pinch me, I'm real. We're just men. We're not gods, as you suppose. We are also men of the same nature as you. And we preach the gospel to you. Now stop. Now don't glaze over. I know that was all interesting. That was a really cool story about foreign people. And about, that was really fun. Yeah. And now I say, now we're going to preach the gospel. People are like, oh yeah, Jesus Christ, blah, 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 blah. Well, just hold on. What's the word gospel mean? Okay. I'm going to talk to you about what's going on. First thing is, <coughs> they're trying to tell them, don't add me to your God collection, amen? amen? These guys had gods for everything, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you got Zeus and you got Hermes, anybody remember their uh, history uh, classes Greek. from the 8th grade? Who else you got? Jupiter, Apollo, uh, Venus. Yeah. Is it ridiculous we can remember that? So, okay, so so who are we talking to? 
we were talking to a whole group. Of, uh, imagine that all of you had your own bunches of gods, and they feel, they come in pairs and in, in groups. It's like grapes. You don't just get one. You get a whole bunch of them because one isn't good enough. One doesn't do everything. One they're very specialized. It's really like the medical field. Okay, you can't just have one doctor anymore. You know, you gotta have one doctor for your you know your elbow, and, and one for the kneecap, and one for this just the left ear. So, you know, so you have so many because these gods are incredibly specialized. Now, let me tell you, Zeus, for example, let's talk about Zeus. Uh, the two guys that they're, they're saying, here's Zeus, they're going to call Leonard Zeus. Yeah. And, and, and they're going to call, you know he says. <laughs> and Kathy is, is, is Hermes. Now, let me tell you about these gods. Zeus, well, he's a winner. Zeus, the, the god of, of sky and thunder. Who else would, do we know about that? Thor, right? Okay, in Greek mythology, his Roman counterpart is whatever. Zeus, now listen to this. Here, here's, your, here's your resume, Zeus. You are the child of Cronus and Rhea, and the youngest of his siblings. In most traditions, you are married to Hera. Sorry, Kath. <laughs> you are married to Hera, although at the Oracle of Dodona, your consort Dione, sorry, Kath, according to the Iliad, he is the father of Aphrodite by Dione, not his wife, but his consort. He is known for his erotic escapades. These resulted in many godlike and heroic offsprings, including Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Hermes, and Persephone, but that was by Demeter, the other broad. Dionysus Perthes, Hera, Helen of Troy, Minos and Muses, was by some girl named Nemesine. But Hera, he is usually said to have fathered Ares, Heba, and Hephaestus. <laughs> How do you keep up? <laughs> then there's Hermes. Hermes was the god of transitions and boundaries, the intercessor between mortals and the divine, and conductor of souls. There you go, into the afterlife. He is protector and patron of travelers, herdsmen, and thieves. What? <laughs> He's also the protector of orators and wit. So if you're bright, you get it. Literature and poets, athletic sports, invention and trade. And in some myths, he is a trickster and outwits other gods for his own satisfaction. That's Hermes. I mean, talk about really nice attributes for your gods, right? This is who they what? Worship. What was worship? Honor, reverence, supreme love. Okay. Now you couldn't just have one. I'll get you. I'll get you. I'll get you. Okay. Yeah. Look. Now it says. Remember, they're going to come and they're sacri They're ready to sacrifice. And he says, instead of sacrificing, we're going to preach the gospel to you. Now I want you to pay very close attention to what he is going to preach. What good news is going to be preached to these idolaters? Idolaters. Now when I say idolater, what am I saying? Somebody who doesn't worship God, the true God, Yahweh, right? Someone who doesn't worship God. Do they worship? Yes. Do they worship gods? Yes. Are they worshiping the one true God? No. How many do they have? Many. Oh my God! They got okay. Yeah, like great. That you. Right, here's the first thing that he says. I'm preaching the good news to you that you should turn from these what? Vain, vain things. What vain things? God. Right. All of these things that aren't God. The gods which they and they fathers have worshipped are worthless. They're unreasonable. They're unprofitable. They are false. They are false in the sense that there is no advantage to be gained from it. Get it? There's no advantage to be gained from whatever they're worshipping. And this, here's a verse for you. I'm going to read your verse out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 9 says, For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, 
how you turn to God from idols to serve a, what kind of a God? A living and true. Living and true, contrasting with dead and false. So these guys are worshiping dead and false versus living and true. All right, you guys got that? All right, now, it says, number one, you're, they're dead and they're false. And you need to turn from them. And you, what you need to do now is to worship a what? Living God. A living God. They had been worshiping dead images that were utterly unable to help them. Now, they're ready to bring that worship to mortal men who also will die. Barnabas and Paul. They're just a couple more, you know, Joes, a couple more humans. It's all so disgustingly low. Lizards, <laughs> creeping things, right? It's so low compared to what we heard last week in Ezekiel of, oh, get it? It's stupid. It's, you're like, God, this is a no-brainer. Secondly, they're saying you need to turn from these dead images and now they're being persuaded to worship a living God. A God who has life in himself. And who has life for others eternally. This, this is some good news, people. Yes. This is some gospel now. And that he, God, is the one who did what? Yes. Made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So he just covered everything that these people could possibly relate to. Can you relate to anything? Yeah. Is that better than Zeus? Yeah. Zeus can't. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thirdly, what he's saying is that this God is the creator of the world. That he is the fountain of all life and being. That he is the great power. You worship gods which you make. Now think about it. Any God that anybody would worship, who makes them? Man. Man makes them. Whether it's, you know, my favorite one is where they, they, they take the log and they chop it in half, and half of it they put on the fire to cook their dinner, and then the other half they set up <laughs> and, work, and, and bow down to. I'm like, really? That's crazy. Yeah. But you know what? It's no crazier than what we do. Because any of our gods that we worship, things that we reverence and things that we honor are things that we ourselves have made, amen? I mean, think about it. What about you? Do you love and reverence and honor? You're like, no, we don't. We're not a bunch of idol worships. Really? Okay, given the choice, you know, this is, here's my acid test. Here's the only way I know if I'm an idolater. Well, here's one of the ways. Knowing to do good, I choose to do evil. Why would they do that? If, if I knew that God wanted my obedience as part of worship. Do you understand? Knowing to love and choosing not to love. Would that be idolatry? Yes. Well, yeah. Why? 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 Because it's all about me. You, you cranked me last week. You angered me. Okay? So I'm not going to love you because it's all about you. you see what I'm saying? Is that idolatry? Why sure it is. You know, it's like, oh, I would love to come and minister to you, but my favorite TV show is on. <laughs> well, now, what would that be? What's my feeling? Idolatry. 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 Oh, okay, I really can't love and take care of my family because I am too busy. I have to finish all these messages, Facebooky things. You know what I mean? I know dinner's going to be late and everybody's going to be pissed with me, but this is what I have to do. You understand? What would that be? Idolatry. Like, right, give me some more idolatry that really makes sense. Pornography. How about that? More? How can we fight idolatry if we can't name it? Your job. Yeah, show me how what that actually looks like. Workaholic. Our, our, our food. Can we can right. So when you're upset, what do you run to? The phone or the throne? 
If I run to the phone and the person I'm calling, I value them more than I would value who? God. Okay, if when I'm upset, I eat, then, in, you see what I'm saying? Then the food becomes my uh, idol. Right, my God. This is because he's <coughs> supposed to provide something for me that I'm missing. This is why they had hundreds of gods, people, because you have to be the god of the sea. You're the god of the sky. You're the god of the land. You're the god of relationships. You're the god of the rain. You're the god of the gerbils. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're the god of the sun. Okay. So, did you get all that? Don't be a test. So, when you need sun for your crops, who are you going to pray to? Okay. Ron. Ron. Okay. When you're having trouble with your relationships, who are you going to pray to? Gerbil. All right. When your gerbil is dying, who are you going to pray to? Jim. Okay. And when? Okay. And when you're looking for sunny day, you know, and, and you know, whatever, who are you going to pray to? All right. Okay. You understand? Uh, specific. They were very, very specific. Okay. Seriously. So if I needed. If I needed, you know, gerbil help, I'm going to go to Gerbil Boy's <laughs> temple. I'm going to worship and bow down, right, to Tim. Okay? But then the gerbil dies. I'm not coming there anymore. I am going over here because I need a boyfriend. So I worship now Aphrodite. See what I'm saying? And once I get my boyfriend, I don't need you anymore. I'm having trouble with my crops over here. So I'm going, this is why they had hundreds and hundreds of gods. Because they were very specialized. And they needed help with so much stuff that they had to create a god for each situation that they needed. That's why there's, you know, Greek mythology, Roman. I don't care if you're Roman. You can, you can go to uh, Africa and find hundreds of gods. Asia, hundreds of gods. India, right? Hundreds of gods, all specialists. It's crazy. Now, okay. Are you, are you following me? Okay. So he's preaching, your gods are false and dead, but there's a living God who made heaven and earth and the sea. Everything. Wait a minute. We just counted, you know, wait, so what are you saying? I don't need the gerbil god? No. How about the sky god? No. How about when I need rain? You're talking to an agrarian culture. I don't have to pray to the rain god anymore? No. Why? What are you saying? There's only one. Now for people who are worshiping hundreds of them, is that not good news? Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, the time saving. <laughs> I mean, let's just look at this from the sacrificial standpoint. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is crazy. That's some serious good news. Now, you call, if you call on and you worship the true God, then you no longer have to cheat yourself by worshiping pretenders. And to worship anything other than God, to venerate and to honor anyone but this, this God, is to cheat yourself, not to mention him, on pretenders. To worship the sovereign Lord of all, you do not belittle yourself in bowing down to creatures and disgusting creations rather than the creator. In Acts 14, the next verse, here's what, here's the third part of this good news. I'm going to watch this. He says, and I'm preaching the gospel to you, you're turning away from living things, to uh, dead things, you're going to a living God. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their what? Talking about mankind as a whole and the generations of mankind, God allowed them to make their own free will choices, and they, the people chose and left the ways of God. From Tower of Babel, think about that. You know, from before that, from, oh my gosh, Adam and Eve, you know, mankind has 
chosen to worship something other than God. And it has always and will always get him in hot water. And God is, here's the more of this gospel message. The good news is that God has not fried you for your choices of idols. That's God's mercy. This speaks to God's love and mercy. People, it speaks loudly to us today. Amen? But now, Switch here to this verse. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. Because didn't we just hear that? The God is, he's the one who made heaven and earth and, and the sea and all that's in it. This God who made the earth, he is Lord of heaven and earth. He does not dwell in what? Temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. This isn't what Paul and Barnabas are saying in Acts 14 in Lystra. This is what is being said by Paul later when he's at Mars Hill, who also with a bunch of other people who have a whole bunch of gods, right? But what he does say that I want you to get right here, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Why? That they would seek God. Man is a worshiper. God shaped home. God shaped home. <clears throat> that they would seek God and perhaps they would grope for him and find him, though he is not far away. <coughs> for in him we what? <laughs> that's where that's where our whole life is. <coughs> but we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. <coughs> Therefore, having overlooked these times of ignorances, people, we've got times of ignorances in our lives. Amen? You know, by the grace of God, you're living and you're standing here today and are able to still make a choice about who you're going to worship by your free will. He overlooked the times of ignorance, but God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should what? Repent. Repent from what? Yes, from giving their heart, soul, mind, and strength to anything other than who? God. God. <coughs> he will judge the world on that. He has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Talking about him. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. So the good news to these people is that God is overlooking your ignorance as he has us today. We're going to finish up closing the 17th verse of Acts. In this good news, Paul is saying, look, he's back to, you know, we're back to Lystra. He just said, Give up the dead and false gods. Worship a living God who made heaven and earth and everything else. And he says, you know what? And he did not leave himself without witness. This God I'm talking to, he's not invisible. He didn't leave himself without witness. In that he did good and gave you what? Rains, Rains from heaven and fruitful seasons. Satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. He is talking to what kind of a culture? An agrarian, an agricultural culture, which means their entire lives revolve around what? The harvests. If there is no rain, there are no crops. If there are no crops, there is no food. If there is no food, there is no life. Get it? So this they understand. Wait a minute. He's the one who sends the rain? <coughs> yes. On the just and on the unjust. Not only does he provide, but he loves. Not only does he love, but he is, loves indiscriminately. He, he is merciful to all. You guys have been sucking up the rain and didn't even know where it came from. You've been worshiping something that has nothing to do with it. And your hearts have been satisfied with food and with gladness. Oh my gosh. Praise God. Yeah. And even after saying all of this, 
Here's a verse. Are there many among the idols of the nations who give rain? Anybody? Anybody? No. no. Or can the heavens grant showers? Is it not you, O Lord, our God? Therefore, we hope in who? Yeah. So why would you hope in anybody else? We hope in you, for you are the one who has done all these things. So here we are, we're back in Lystra. This is the end of the record. Well, it's the end of where we were going to leave it today. What happens is, he says all this, he shows them, you gods, they're false, they're dead. There is a living God who has made heaven and earth. This is all really good news. This is the gospel. This is, and, and, he, and he said all this, and it says, even then, they are so desperate to worship someone, something, they took all they had to keep them from sacrificing them to them. Isn't that insane? Man wants to fill that God-shaped hole, and he is desperate to do so. So many worthless things have been shoved in there, amen? I've got some. How about you? I've got things that I revere way too much. Other people's opinion, what other people think, that's too important to me. You know what I'm saying? How I look, maybe that's too important to me. Dr. Ted Tripp says, talking about the outward man, how much time do we spend on the outward man in opposition to how much time do we spend on the inward man? You know, our concerns are too, still yet too carnal. So God has a rightful place. Not only is it in Ezekiel with all of the creatures and the 24 elders and the trumpets, he has a rightful place, and it is your heart. Your heart is his rightful place. Nothing else. Your heart is a God-shaped hole. That's the God. That is that innate, God-given desire to be dazzled and be impressed. Let me tell you, the creatures in heaven who see the rainbows and who see the barrel throne and all this, they are dazzled and they are properly impressed. Amen? And they are responding properly by going, holy, holy, holy. Should we be less impressed? As, as grasshoppers, shouldn't we be even more impressed? Should we respond with less than they do? Who are in the very throne room of God? Right now, we can choose where to start here. We looked at, you know, how what God is getting in heaven is what he deserves, isn't it? With people laying down and throwing their crowns at his feet. I mean, you know, giving up everything. There's no pride in heaven. Amen. You know, there, there's no history. Well, I've been in the Word 20 years. Well, I've been a preacher for 10 million eons. <laughs> you know, there's none of that. Well, I have this title. There's none of that. All titles, they're throwing down at his feet. And saying, worthy are you, O oh Lord, to receive glory and honor. Why does that not work down here? Why do we still hang on to the titles and to the hurts and to the pride and to the histories? But what I deserve or what I don't deserve. Why? Why? Maybe we need to get a little closer to the throne room of God. Because they don't seem to be having an issue. What should, when Jesus said... Here's what you pray. Thy will be done on earth, even as it is being done in heaven. In heaven, they are worshiping God. Hallelujah. Why not here? Why not, why not you? Why not now? He did not leave you without a witness either in how he has cared for your life. You are alive because of his provision. You have what you have, and you are who you are. Everything. Because of God Almighty. We should have, we have no less of a, we have no excuse to respond with any less worship and awe and being dazzled 
than the creatures at the very throne. Look around you. Look outside today. Look around. Consider his creation. Look at all that he has provided for you. Think about the times he has answered one prayer. And that should be enough. Look at the mercies upon your life. Look at the forgiveness of your sins. The kindnesses that you have been shown by this creator God. Look at how he has satisfied your hearts with food and gladness. And forget not all of his benefits. Why do we sing, Victor asks? Because he is worthy. Why do we worship? Because we were made to do so. We were made to worship a creator who is worthy, who is holy. God, I'm asking you to help us to get this. Because it's not as blatant as little idol figures. We don't, <clears throat> we don't always know what we've shoved into that need to, to venerate and to honor. But I know that it should only be you, and where it is, and I'm asking you to reveal that unto us, that you would show our hearts. Show us where we put something in that heart above you. Lord, help us to get rid of it. Help us to love you greater because that's what you made us for. Help us to not be deceived into worshiping a lie. Help us to not put our trust and our faith in men. Help us, Lord, to put our trust and our faith in Christ alone. And I ask you for your help today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.